There are three songs in our hymnal that are all written to the exact same tune. And we're going to sing all three of them back to back to back. So if you want to uh, follow along in the hymnal, you're welcome to. The numbers will be up here. Otherwise, we'll keep the words going along. And this is a song Brother Shehorn came across a couple years back before we even had these hymnals. And I think we've sung once before. And uh, I really appreciate the words to it. And I trust they'll speak to your heart this morning. Amen. And I then 
shall live as one who's learned compassion. And I've been so long that I'll risk love loving too. I know how fear builds walls instead of bridges, and I dare to see another's point of view. And when relationships demand commitment, then I'll be Well, your kingdom come around and through and in me, your power and glory, let them shine through me, your hallowed name, oh, may I bear with honor. And may your living kingdom come in me. The bread of life, oh, may I share with honor. And may you feed a Still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, ye faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Oh, be still my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, though haze and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. And be still, my soul, be happy
Psalms 127 and verse 1 gives us this foundational truth. Unless the Lord builds the house, those labor in vain that build it. If we try to do it in our own strength, friends, we're going to fail. Those that were here last Sunday night, you know, we talked about the parable of the two houses, and the one that was built upon the rock and the one that was built upon the sand, and this kind of goes directly on top of that. And um, I want to talk to you this morning about the essential nature of a Christian home. And when we talk about building a house, I think a home is a very special version of a household, right? A house is just a building. A home is something much more than that. And, uh, but, you know, I still believe that this, this truth remains. When it says here that unless the Lord builds the house, those labor in vain that build it, I don't think that's talking about a physical building so much. In fact, I've seen a lot of people build buildings that weren't Christians hardly at all, and they're still standing, right? It's the home version that we're talking about, right? The relationship portion of a house or a household, unless God's included in it. Um, you know, I, there are some non-Christian marriages that last and last many years. But I think the percentages are a lot lower than those that are built upon Christ. And certainly, um, I think the, the success, not only of the marriage staying together, but the flourishing of it. It's different when it's established upon the right foundation, the foundation of Christ. And uh, with just that text as a background, I'd like to have a word of prayer this morning as we come together into the message. And um, I've got several thoughts to share with you, and uh, I, I trust you'll pray for me this morning. Some of them aren't the most comfortable to share. There's a lot of statistics in here that maybe aren't going to be easy to look at or easy to hear. Um, and I, I don't approach any of this this morning as if I have all the answers, but I serve the one who has all the answers. And that's the intent this morning. God help us to build it all up on his foundation. Allow that to be the background this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before thee this morning. We're looking to you, dear Lord. We thank you and praise you for your divinity, dear Lord, for your omnipotence as you're still over all. We know and believe that you're in control. We've seen it, dear Lord. We praise you for our heritage that you've given and the difference that it makes in each of our lives. We're trusting in you today. We pray, dear Lord, that as each of us are here, whatever stage we may be in, dear Lord, in our lives, we pray that you'd help us to gain something from your word this morning, from the truth of it. Help us, dear Lord, as I expound upon it to say what needs to be said, what would be in accord with your will, and certainly what's accurate in accord with your word. We're looking to you today to add the blessing and use it, dear Lord, to your glory. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, this type of a message is a little bit difficult because there's only a couple of us here this morning that are still in the middle of currently raising a family in our home, right? But when it comes to your home, I think it does extend past that, whether your children still live with you or not. Um, for, the, for, for the most part, they certainly consider themselves still a close part of our family, and I think the influence remains, as we've already talked about today. And I kind of came across this question, even this morning, that I've been thinking about, and, and there was an author that posed this question. He asked this, Are your children raised in a Christian home? Or just in a Christian culture? Are your children being raised in a Christian home? Or are they instead just being raised in a Christian culture? A Christian home in quite simple terms is one in which God is alive and present in the lives of the parents. It's not just Christian in name but in reality. To truly be a Christian home, it has to be a home where the parents have the presence of the Spirit of Almighty God and His holiness within their lives and working. That's what's required to truly have a Christian home. A man by the name of Harold Martin, who, not the Harold Martin that some of you might know, who's head of Mission Flights International. This is a gentleman that I'm not familiar with, but he wrote this and I thought it was good. He said, the nearest thing to heaven on earth is the Christian family and home, where husband and wife, parents and children live together in love and peace devoted to God and to each other. 
By way of contrast, the nearest thing to hell on earth is the ungodly home, broken by sin and iniquity, where parents quarrel and bicker and separate, and where children are given over to the forces of wickedness to be brought up with scarcely any training at all. I would ask what makes the difference between a truly Christian home. What Mr. Martin said is the closest thing to heaven on earth. And I have to think that he might just be right. And what is one of the most disparaging and destructive things on earth. And that's a home that's full of sinfulness and wickedness and iniquity. That leads to all sorts of strife and quarrels and difficulties in life. What makes the difference? I think there's two key pieces to this. The first thing that is absolutely destructive to a home or to a household is for it to be an incomplete household. I believe upon the authority of God's word. This isn't just my opinion, I don't believe now. I think God created man and woman on purpose. And his word says that man and woman shall leave their parents and cleave unto one another, right? And create their own family. That is what I believe is the household structure. It's important to, um, as we're able, follow the command of God to repopulate the earth and be parents and enjoy the blessings and privileges of that. That's a wonderful thing to have the love of a household and to have the love of my parents. Because uh, I've left and started a family of my own doesn't mean that I disrespect my parents or don't love my parents. I think we all understand that, right? That wasn't God's intention. But it was God's intention. For there to be a man and a woman that work together in creating a household and upkeeping a household and growing a household. And that is the foundation on which the dominion of mankind over the earth as God's prized creation was built. I firmly believe that. God created men and women to do some different things. And by the way, that's not a popular message in 2020. But it's not my opinion. It's the way God created things to some extent. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we come along here. But I firmly believe that God created a household to be run by a man and a woman together. And when it's incomplete, either one of those is missing. We see dramatic problems. But particularly when children are raised without a father. It's detrimental. What proof do I have for that? Well, a lot. And uh, I'll try to put sources in here included where they can. Some of them are in the fine print. These first few slides are from the U.S. Census Bureau, and it's from 2017. So it's about the most recent thing that they've put out. And they put it like this. There's a father absence crisis in America. And by the way, I don't think this is just an American issue, but we're American people. Right. And that's where our focus has to lie first is with us individually and then us locally and us as a nation. And um, it's been my privilege to get to minister abroad a little bit. But I think our primary focus is here. We can look at this data quite, quite well. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 19.7 million children. That's more than 25 percent are now being raised without a father. And when they say without a father. That statistic means without the biological father, a stepfather, or a foster parent, or adopted parent. That is being raised by single moms, basically, in one form or another. Without a father figure. 19.7 million without even a stepfather. Um, what sort of problems does that bring? Well, there's all sorts of them, and it's all here together. Four times greater risk of poverty. And that same study has been done over and over by many different organizations. And the number is almost exactly the same. Four times greater risk of living below the poverty line. Seven times more likely for the young ladies to become pregnant as a teenager. Um, by the way, one of the things that was talked about here is the difference between young men and young women as they're growing up in response to fatherlessness. Boys are more likely to act out, right? And when the lack of the father is there and the lack of discipline is there and the lack of instruction is there, the lack of a father figure is there, it's more obvious in their behavior because they act out. Girls are more likely to shell it in and back away and hide it and look for it in another place. And that's 
one of the reasons that we get this statistic. They're significantly more likely to have behavioral problems, particularly the boys, again, more likely to face abuse and neglect because there's not that protector of the household that God put in place there to shelter directly the children on a consistent basis. Here's one that blew my mind. Two times greater risk of infant mortality. Why? Because when a mother's trying to do it alone, she's got a lot more on her plate. And it's not just what happens inside the house. It's the stress of having to go out and provide and do other things. Significantly more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. By far more likely to go to prison. There was one uh, study done, I think Texas did a survey on all of their incarcerated inmates and something like 70% of them grew up without a father. Two times more likely to suffer obesity, much more likely to commit crimes. And this one says two times more likely to drop out of high school. I've also, and, and that would probably be about right because the statistics I've seen is somewhere around 70% of high school dropouts are without fathers. So 70, 30 would be roughly two to one. 19.7 million children without a father in the household. I don't stand before you this morning with the answer to that. But I think the first step to resolving any problem is recognizing that there is a problem. And then from there, we can carry that burden to the Lord and allow him to lead us in what we can do it on an individual basis. Children from fatherless homes and I can't read that, it's too small a print, so I'm going to come down here because I can't see it on the back. 63% of suicides, 90% of runaways, 85% of behavioral disorders. Again, right around 70% of high school dropouts, 70% of juvenile detentions, 75% substance abuse in adolescence, 75% of rapists that are motivated by displaced anger. That's an older study, that's 1998 but it's one that is still referenced widely because the numbers haven't, the percentages haven't changed much. Now the good news is it's not gotten a lot worse, I guess, in 20 years, but it's also not improved. 39% of basically children that are in school under high school age are without a father in the home. And here's one that's interesting, and I don't, I don't say this to make a divide, friends. But when something stands out like this, we know that there is a cause behind it. I don't know the cause, but there is a cause behind it. 20% among Caucasians, 31% in Hispanics, and 57% amongst African American families. Um, I've got some friends that I'd like to talk to about that and try to maybe better understand the disparity there and what's going on. My father, most of you know, works in a prison. And he has had the opportunity in the last couple of years to pre to, to I say preach a class. That's probably what he does, but teach a class technically within the prison. Um, he's had the opportunity to teach a class as one of the officers. He was asked if he would do this on being a father and a good father figure to your children. And uh, speaking to inmates who a large percentage of them are African American. Um, and, and it's a good thing that he has the opportunity to do that and to relate to them. And he could probably speak to this a lot better than I could. Um, but, but it's a real problem. But what he found is that nearly without exception, every single one of them grew up without a father. And the reason that they chose to come and voluntarily take the class is because they didn't want their kids to end up in the same place. And I think that's a good step. To provide that support and try to provide a way and uh, certainly the place to start with those individuals was my dad encouraging him to say well the first thing you've got to do is get out of here right be good put in your time but get out and go back and be a father and um, there's an estimated 63 64.3 million men in america this is back to 2017 statistics who are currently fathers 26 and a half million of those are not actively involved in their child's life on an everyday basis. Again, comes back to roughly the 40% number that are without a father figure in their life. 
Again, I don't have the answers to fixing that. But I do serve the God who has the answers. And I think it starts with this. The message of the gospel makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. I I don't know. I, I could have very easily found statistics, I'm sure, on how many of those children were conceived out of wedlock. But if we just follow the instructions of the Bible to where a home is to be built with a man and a woman together who are married... And relations to be had inside of marriage and children to be raised together in those things. I think that solves a, a significant portion of the problem. And then as marriages come together, if they were based upon God and upon the saving grace of the gospel with transformed individuals where old things of inherent sin go away and their lives are changed and focused upon God and living good and living for Him as they ought to, I think this, the parents would stay together more often. And I don't think that that's really controversial. I think history shows us that. Now you have to go back a couple hundred years to really see that. But we certainly can see it, even in American history, that as the family has devolved, society has unfortunately followed it in many instances in the same directions. The first big problem is an incomplete home. But probably what is more... By the way, it's one thing to bring up a problem, it's another thing to present a solution. I I don't have any big overarching solutions other than the gospel is key. And then outside of that, I think where we're able, we should, knowing that there is a problem, find children be sure that they have as best as we can particularly those of us guys go find a young person and be a father figure to them and i'm so thankful for those of us in our church that have done that particularly through our youth group and through the kids that we're ministering to many of them are from single parent homes many of them um and some of them i've certainly had the chance to put my arm around and I had one of them that sat down with me just a few weeks ago and looked me in the eye and said you're a closer thing to a dad to me than my real dad has ever been and he and his real dad were kind of into it and he was asking me for advice on how to treat his father you talk about difficult conversations but at the same time when it's over and you're alone you just sit there and cry because of what's going on In one sense, it's a privilege to be able to be respected enough to try to provide some direction. And I I sure hope that I can continue to do that, right? And see some of these young men become to be what God would have them to be. But in the same sense, it's heartbreaking to see young people going through those challenges. God help us to be an example where we can. What are we talking about? The essential nature of a Christian home. I believe God created it to be the building block of his creation. And when that fails, much other things that God intends fail around us. So an incomplete home was a big problem. But then after that, we begin to have, if we're not careful, an unbalanced home. And so I want to take some time this morning to look primarily into what the Bible says about the duties of the various members of the family to each other and also certainly to the Lord as we ground our faith in the Lord. And I'll start with the one that's going to get me in hot water. Maybe I ought to end with this so you'll listen to me for the other three instead of turning me off beforehand. But um, particularly as a male pastor, this is difficult. Right, But it is certainly within the scripture. There are duties of wives to their husbands. And just so you know, the next one is the other direction. Okay, So we're going to touch on both ways this morning. (laughs) But certainly we see here the duty of a wife to her husband. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the Lord. Of the church. Now, this isn't popular, but the fact of the matter is, marriage is not exactly a 50 50 proposition. It ought to be very close to that. But God 
and his ultimate wisdom, some things that we don't understand and can't explain, set it up the way that is best, whether we understand it or not. And our Lord pretty plainly says here in Ephesians, through Paul as he wrote it, the husband is the head of the wife. Now this does not mean in any way, shape, or form that the wife is less important or less critical or less essential. In fact, I would argue exactly the opposite. That the wife is critically essential within the household. It certainly does not mean that she is to be a slave or a subservient of any kind to the husband. But it does mean that in situations where needed, it's the wife's place to submit to the leadership role of a husband. The only exception that Scripture very clearly gives in the book of Acts is if a husband were to ask the wife to violate clear scriptural teachings, then obviously you're not to submit to that. But otherwise, God put the husband in a leadership role. The Lord commands in the same respect husbands to love their wives. And if the husband follows that command as ought to. Again, here we're talking about the essential nature of a Christian family, right? For both sides to hold up their portion. And for in order for it to be a Christian home, that was the premise I started with here. It has to be two parents, two, a, a husband and a wife, a mother and a father working together in accord with the Spirit of the Lord. And if a husband loves their wife, and the example it gives is as Christ loved the church. Wow, what an example, right? A husband's to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And if a husband really does that, then a wife has no problem and no difficulty being in subjection because the husband's doing his part. And when problems arise, oh, and by the way, problems will come up. Amen? Some of you have been married a lot longer than me, and you can say amen to that. Amen. William, are you listening? <laughs> problems will come up. And when they come up, they've got to be carefully discussed. Imagine that. Communication matters. You know, communication is key between us and our Heavenly Father. Our relationship between us and our Heavenly Father, communication is key. To have time of prayer and to read in His Word and learn from Him and listen to Him. And it's just as much, if not more, the key, well, just as much the key in our earthly relationships. When problems come up, you've got to discuss it out. More or less, a vote should be taken. Hopefully, most of the time, you're going to agree, and that's wonderful, right? My wife and I largely do. And we've built our pattern on how we have these discussions and do it in such a way that it goes generally pretty well. But ultimately, I think here, when it says that the husbands are to be the head, if it comes out to a tie... There's one of those that has the leadership role. And unless it clearly violates scripture, it would be my impression that's the direction it should go. Now, some of you have been married a lot longer than me and maybe even know more about the scripture than me. So you correct me if I'm wrong, all right? But I, I think that's the intention here. The wife is to be in subjection. Secondly, the wife is to respect and admire her husband. Verse, Ephesians 5:33. Let every one of you husbands so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. One of the greatest things for our marriage, and I need to go back and read it again probably, is a book that was recommended to us early on in our marriage. It's a book called Love and Respect. And the premise of the book, and I've talked about this different times, is that men and women value different things. Women value love. They're created by God to be more emotional beings. And they value careful love and attention and nurturing and, and um, being told that and certainly treated in such a way. And men are keyed and wired by God to value respect, right? And the way that you treat one another in that, you need to understand that and treat one another in such of those ways. And we see that even here in Scripture. See that the wife reverence her husband. Let every one of you husbands love his wife. We say that even right here in Scripture. And so, uh, what does respect mean? Well, I think uh, you can ask some questions to that. By the way, this seems to even be true for the wife who has an unsaved husband. We see You can read about that in 1 Peter chapter 3. 
But basically, it talks about for an ungodly husband and a godly wife, if you continue to still respect him where you can without violating scripture, that doing so, your life will draw him back to God. And I have seen that happen in my family. My one aunt lived with my Uncle Mark for over 20 years with him unsaved and her saved. And he got saved before he died with cancer. I've seen it work. And so we begin to ask some questions. What kind of life are you living before your husband? Does he see in you a true Christian living? Are you cheerful and loving and loyal? Some wives seemingly drive their husbands away from Christ because they don't respect them. Instead of being cheerful and obedient, they're noted for that awful word of nagging, right? That's what we hear. I will say this. I don't know that there's anything that breaks the spirit of a man any more than that. And I think the reason is it's perceived by the man as a lack of respect. That's the bottom line. And God created men to value respect. And then finally, and I'll really get in trouble with this one, but this is scriptural. Titus chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. Teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet and chaste, and here's the word nobody likes, or the phrase nobody likes, keepers at home. Now, I do believe that God largely made women to do many of the tasks at home. That does not mean that a woman cannot work outside the house. I don't believe that. I've heard preachers that went to that extreme. I don't agree with that. My mother worked outside the home nearly my entire life. But what I do know is she also kept it to be a very careful priority to take care of the things in the home and nurture the children and take care of us and make sure that things were taken care of. Um, and, and, there, and the reason I think God created it that way is because he created women to just be better at it than men, largely, because their compassion and your nurturing nature is different and it's better and it's improved. And where there is the opportunity, such as my wife has, to get to do it full time, I think it's a blessing. Um, I don't think it's a requirement, but I think it's a blessing. All right, let's move on. Maybe I get myself out of a little more trouble here. Duties of husbands to their wives. First of all, obviously, the husband is to honor and respect his wife. First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. What's that mean? Well, you should so... You should be courteous to your wife. It really bothers me. And by the way, I'm not as good at this as I would like to be, but it's something that I want to continue to work on. It bothers me the pattern of many young men to do whatever it takes to woo and get the attention of and earn the favor of a young lady while they're courting and dating and come together. And yes, I'm using some old-fashioned language. That's okay, right? But anyway, you do whatever it takes to get the, the attention of a young lady. And then as soon as you've latched onto them and you got married, all that goes away. Right? Disappears. What happens to the chocolates and flowers and opening the door and saying I love you? And Right? I'm not as good at it as I ought to be. I'll be the first one to admit that. But I hope that I've not completely went to the other side either. Let the husband render, render to his wife courtesies, basic things. And you know, I think we ought to remember that as the wife is taking care of the house and caring for children uh, and taking care of many of those daily duties, there's a lot we can do to help that and make it easier. And we'd have a lot happier wife if we did so, right? It's not hard to have enough respect to not come in with a bunch of dirty clothes and sit down on all the furniture and make a big mess and track it right out across the floor, right? Or throw it in a pile right next to the hamper instead of putting it where it could go. Um, I'll be honest, in our house, where the hamper used to be got moved. It got moved to the place where my clothes used to go all the time anyway. <laughs> and then once it got put in that spot, they all go in it pretty much all the time. And I even do a pretty decent job. We have multiple ones. Are the jeans going one, and the colors going one, and the whites going one? I do a pretty decent job of that now that it's in the right spot, because that's where I used to put it, right? But... Uh, What's my point? Little things can go a long way. And sometimes you work together to get to that point. But little things can make a big difference. 
Secondly, the husband is to consider the physical frailty of the wife. And by the way, none of us think this when we're young and energetic and in such a big hurry to get married, it seems like, right? Just can't wait, can't wait to get into it. And we never think it's going to happen to us. But uh, my wife's had her fair share of physical issues. Certainly we see what Lisa's going through. And there's other young couples, young couples that are going through it. Brother Nichols was talking about uh, at conference, one of the pastors who's happened to resign his position because uh, his wife is in her 40s and on oxygen and completely incapable to help or really do anything. Uh, what, what, a, what a difficulty, right? But you know, there's a reason that the marriage vows say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And that's because the pattern of history just is things are going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean the man is never the one to get sick. But generally, uh, it's more often the other way. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And I don't think that means weaker in determination or dedication or ability or importance. But physically, there just is a difference. We see that really all throughout our society. Look at anywhere where there's a standard to meet. The military, I think, would be a prime example. William could probably speak to this. There is a different standard between men and women to meet for physical fitness, right? To pass the test, as there ought to be, because there's a difference between men and women. Um, did they change it? Well, that's going to go, either they lowered the standard or it's going to be real hard to meet, one or the other. We'll talk about that. That's a different, that's a different discussion. Um, but there are differences. And uh, I, I know, for example, the one, the one that's a pretty clear standard, and maybe this has changed now too, but I remember coming through school, we, were, we had what we called the presidential physical fitness test, right? And uh, every kid in the, in the country was supposed to go through it. And there were not only different standards between boys and girls, there were different tests completely. You were tested on different things. Um, and I think there's reasons for that. Anyway, let's move on. Colossians 3.19, the husband, this is probably most important of it all, is to truly love his wife. Husbands, love your wives. And the version that I have here in front of me says, and be not bitter against them. In other words, treat them with sweetness. The husband is to demonstrate true affection. He should tell her that he loves her and treat her with the same love and gentleness and kindness, again, that they showed in the dating time. I've got more, but I've got to hurry on. Duties of children to their parents. We won't spend a whole lot of time on this one. Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 2. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. It's the duty of every child to respect and honor their parents. And if you're inclined to be ashamed of them, remember they cared for you when you were absolutely unable to care for yourself. There's a whole message in that that ought to be preached at youth camp about every other year, in my opinion. But it's just natural, particularly once you get up into the teenage years, to kind of go the opposite direction. But all of us owe our parents honor and respect and courtesy. And then, secondly, children should accept instruction from parents. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, admonition is something that's really pretty simple, and children can understand it, even at very young ages. Um, children learn pretty early what no means. Wesley's not quite figured it out yet, but he's learning already. He's going to be one in, what, a week. Um, they learn pretty early. Unfortunately, they also learn to use it back before too terribly long. But uh, they do learn what no means. Christian parents um, do a pretty good job, uh, uh, generally, of intending for the welfare of their child. But part of that is that they need admonition. And in return, children should diligently obey their parents. They're instructed to. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. 
probably one of the most beautiful scriptures regarding the childhood of Jesus, says this, He went down to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, still subjected himself to the earthly authority of his parents, that he might be in accord with the scripture when needed to. And then finally, we as parents have, and I guess this is probably the point of the whole message, um, except I believe if one and two aren't done right, then four is impossible to do right. If you as parents don't treat each other correctly, if the statistics that we shared earlier don't show us anything, they tell us that you cannot properly care for your children if you do not properly first treat each other correctly. First of all, parents should teach their children. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We've got to remember every child is born into this world with a sinful nature. And the cute grins of the baby, it doesn't take long to turn into fits of not getting their way. Adelia always kind of threw little fits. Wesley's got this thing where if he's going to throw a fit, you know it's coming because he tucks his head down. And if he can find it, he buries it all the way into the floor. And then here comes a little fit, right? His is more like a whimper than a scream and a terror, but he does the same thing. He throws a fit in his little way. But this is talking about we've got to teach them right from wrong and why that those things are that way, why they act that way, and as they begin to become old enough to understand, lead them through the Scripture to the answer to those things. Teach them the way of salvation. Read to them from good biblical literature. Memorize Bible verses with them, not just ask them to. And it's amazing how much truth a child's mind can absorb and absorb quickly. Secondly, parents should be good examples for their children. By the way, you'll teach them more this way than any other way. Again, and these words shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them. We have to have it in our hearts first and live it before we're going to get anywhere. Thirdly, parents should discipline their children. This is more unpopular today than it's ever been too. But Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says that children should be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the word nurture there refers to discipline. And you know, I think the way that works best with each child is different. And it's up to the parent to figure that out and work through it. It's not... The rod is not always the answer. I'll be the first one to say that. The rod is not always the answer. Um, but it sure worked for me. <laughs> and uh, I'm thankful for it now. I'm very thankful for it now. And you parents know it's not the easiest thing to administer. But there's times it is necessary and it's needed and it works better at the end. What are we talking about? The essential nature of a Christian family. I, I, I really believe, friends, it's the building block of how God intended our world to work. It's the prize creation of God, the household. A joint union of marriage that turns into a family. What ought to be a loving family. A family that's respectful of one another, that shows love to one another. And through that, experiences all the benefits of it. Um, I would have loved to have found some lot more positive statistics to share with you, but particularly with what's going on around us right now, that's, uh, I think, probably a part of the discussion that needs to be had that, by the way, is starting to be mentioned in some places. I need to re-look into this research. But as of a couple of years ago, when I, when I looked into this quite deeply, I was looking into mass shootings on the one thing they had in common. Every single one of them is committed by a male, and every single one of them, at least as of two years ago, had been committed by a young man that grew up without a father. Every single one. And um, 
it's, it's a problem, right? When the, when the family falls apart, then everything else begins to crumble with it. And just because you're raised with a godly mom and dad doesn't mean you're going to turn out perfect by any stretch. We've all seen examples of that as well, right? But it's still the right way to do it. And it's the best way to do it. It's the correct thing to do. And may God help each and every one of us to do our very best to continue it. Whether you've still got children that you're raising, whether you've got grandchildren that you're mentoring and are examples of, uh, or whether you are trying to be a fatherly or motherly figure to any of these precious young people in our church, God help us to do it to the best of our ability, which comes only through our dedication and submission to him first. Amen. God help us this morning.